Amen, Bill. Thank you. I'm glad they didn't assign me that topic, but you did superbly well with it. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm Don Fento, and I and uh, and, uh, I, and I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects in the whole world, and has been since the Jesus Movement: why Christians should stand with Israel. And uh, I got involved in this, as some of you will know, because I wrote this book. That's the latest copy of the Your People Should Be My People that we do have on the, on the table, we'll have on the table. But I got involved with this uh, during the Jesus Movement because I was pastoring a church in downtown, downtown uh, Nashville, Belmont Church. And uh, I, had, I, had, I had been a professor out at Lipscomb University before that. And I was already getting involved with the Jesus people because according to a Time magazine, that one that you saw in the Jesus Revolution that I have a copy of over there in my briefcase and probably show you tomorrow, uh, the Jesus movement, the charismatic movement, three times in an article says started in 1967, which is interesting because it's the same year that Israel took Jerusalem. And that's another whole topic that what happens to Israel uh, has its effect on the whole church. But anyway, so I, uh, I got involved with them and got in trouble at the, at the university because I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit and that wasn't very uh, accepted at that time. So I resigned before I got fired and Belmont called me and said, look, you've got the ministry and we've got the place for it, come over here. And I had the audacity to say to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to. I'm so sick of the institutional church and all the politics. I just want to go rent a warehouse somewhere and put up a sign that says Christians worship here. Everybody welcome. If you want me to go there, you're going to have to pull the slabs. I'm not pulling any. I still feel okay about that. But I was in a home group, which is good, with a group of people. And they all felt like I was supposed to go. And they made a deal with the elders that they'd pay my salary. Because they were only about 65 people at the Belmont Church at that time. So I went to Belmont Church. And within a few months, rather than 65 people, we had about 1,000 they were sitting on the, on the window seals and so packed down the, high, the aisles that I couldn't even, I had to step around them. I, I, had, I had to get up to preach and I had to stay at one place because if I moved, I'd step on somebody. And, um, but in the midst of the people that were coming were Jewish people. And they were, and they were a part of my flock. And so I started meeting with them every week to try to help them figure out what was going on because for 18, 19 centuries, when a Jewish person came to faith, both the church and the synagogue said, said you're not Jewish anymore, which is totally absurd. But all of a sudden, in the Jesus movement, the, there were Messianic synagogues that started being formed. So I got involved with the Messianic movement and made some trips up to Maryland and visited with Asher and Trader, and at that time met Paul and all these people that were involved in that and became a father figure inside that movement. And so that's, uh, that's how I got involved in it. But uh, so, I, so I wanna give you some reasons now, and some of this is gonna be very, uh, nothing unusual for any of you, but, I, but hold on to me because I really do genuinely believe there's, a, there's something I'm gonna say a little bit further on that I even had never expressed it like this, and I think I can encourage you to go home and get your Bibles and, and see it the way I'm seeing it now. So, let me just start, start by saying then some of the reasons why. Number one, a very, very obvious one, but we're to stand with Israel because in standing with Israel, we come under God's blessing. Amen. Now that's, everybody in the room knows this passage in Genesis 12, where God says, go from your country, Abraham, your people and your father's household to the land I'll show you and I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I'll make your name great, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on the earth will be blessed through you. I will bless those who bless you, he said to Abraham. And, and so I, 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 per, okay, I personally believe people ask me how, I happen to be 93 years old, soon 94, and, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't say, but, but people ask me, what's your secret? I won't tell you. One of the secrets I believe is because I've been blessing Israel for decades. I genuinely believe that. But, it's, uh, but the church as a whole has not blessed the descendants of Abraham. And, and even nations will lose their world power when they turn against Jerusalem. 
Egypt will never be a world power again. Rome will never be a world power again. Assyria will never be a world power again. Spain's navy used to rule the world. They'll never be a world power again. The sun never set on the British Empire until they turned their back on Israel. And so this happens to Israel, but it also happens, and even in the, in the early believers, when it's somehow that the Roman believers, I don't know how it all happened, but the, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the church began to turn its back on Israel and require Jewish people not to s- celebrate Sabbath or circumcise their sons or bar mitzvah of their sons, which is all godless, and early church fathers like John Chrysostom in the, in the third century said, as for me, I hate the synagogue, I hate the Jews. He was a strong person in the church in that day. We all know in 1492, it was Christian rulers that turned against the the Jewish people and exiled them, confiscated their wealth or killed them or forced them to convert, but then didn't didn't trust all that. Even the great Martin Luther who who helped in so much revival in the community of believers in his old days because the Jewish people didn't come to faith and they thought, he thought they were going to, he said, and I'll just quote this, just this one sentence, but there's a whole thing that he said about them. He said, their synagogues should be set on fire and their homes should be broken down and destroyed. Martin Luther's words fed, were fodder in the heart and mouth of Adolf Hitler. And listen to this one. Gerhard Kittel, who was a German New Testament scholar wrote in 1933, one year before Hitler came to power, and in talking about the Jewish question, he said they should accept discrimination and defamation as their due as second-class citizens whose lot is to wander restless and homeless on the face of the earth. That's a theologian one year before Hitler came to power. There's a, there's a brother that in recent years, he may still be living, but I think he is, William Koenig, who wrote a book called Eye to Eye, in which he talks about when decrees are made against the, the Jewish people, it has its effect on us. And he talks, the, the, the one that, that I remember really, really well is, he tells about what happened when George W. Bush, in the year 2005, encouraged Ariel Sharon, the Prime Minister of Israel, to vacate Gaza, to give it over to the Palestinians and let them rule, give land for peace. And and they did it in late 2005. And what happened at the same time, the worst hurricane in US history, Katrina, hit our southern shore. And what happened to Ariel Sharon? Within a month or two, he went into a coma and was in a coma for eight years until he died in 2014. It's it's serious to turn our hearts against the the Jewish people. The second reason, so, so the first, the second reason is because Israel was destined to be a light to the nations. Isaiah 42, 6 and 49, 6 say, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. And all through Old Testament scripture, there are passages that show us that God's intention through the very beginning was to use the Jewish people to bless all the nations. For example, in Psalm 67, verse seven, may the Lord bless us so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Or Psalm, or Isaiah two, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be exalted as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will flow to it. And then of course, in Acts, the first chapter, verse eight, Jesus says to his disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So we're to stand with Israel because it's Israel's destiny to, and still is, to be a light to the nations. The third reason I have here is, and you may never have thought about this one, I was teaching at a a 
Wawam base in Kona, Hawaii, one time several years ago, and I was asked to speak the next day, and I heard the Lord say, and I was shocked, there's not a single command in the scripture where God tells a Gentile to evangelize the world. Now, don't run off from me yet, <laughs> but I challenge you to find me one. It's not there. Our Gentiles role and mandate to evangelize the world comes by way of the Jewish people. If we cut ourselves off from the Jewish people, we have no such mandate. Listen to Matthew 28, well-known passage. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. I like that because if Jesus has all authority, the devil doesn't have any. He just acts like he does. He has all authority and he says, therefore, Go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. That's the mandate that the Gentiles have. It comes by way of a Jew. And every single Gentile in this room, somewhere back there, a Gentile spoke to a Jew, or you wouldn't be, a Jew rather, spoke to the Gentiles, or you wouldn't be a believer. Because every single one of us can trace, if we knew how to do it, can trace our heritage in the Lord to a Jewish people, a Jewish person who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. The fourth reason that I would say that we are to stand with Israel is because Jesus said he's not coming back until the Jewish people are ready to receive him. You remember that passage in Matthew 23, verse 39, where Jesus says to the Jewish rulers, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the gospel also, Jesus said, has to be preached to every ethnic group and then the end will come. So if, if this is true, then it's imperative for us as Gentiles to be participating with the Lord in bringing the Jewish people to the world, Jewish people to the, to the Lord. I, I've, for decades, I've challenged every single congregation that I know anything about at least to tithe their missions budget, if not more, to Jewish ministry. In fact, the two churches that I'm really, really close with in, uh, in Dallas, I mean, not as, not as close to Gateways in Dallas, but also the Beltway Park Church in Abilene, Texas, that are both are thousands, and both of them would say that one of the reasons they are so blessed is because they have blessed the Jewish people. In fact, I, <laughs> I, I, I brought this because I want to read you. David McQueen, who was the, who's the pastor of Beltway Park, uh, when he became the pastor in the year 2000, he called me, and in his testimony is in the, as, at the back of chapter two on Greater Richards of World Revival. And um, in the year two, he says, in the year 2000, after being called to a pastor at Abilene, Texas, I called Don Fento, asking to travel with him, desiring as a young pastor to gain wisdom from his pastoral leadership. He informed me that he was soon going to the Messianic Jewish Alliance in Pennsylvania, and I was free to join him. Although I had no information about the alliance, I decided that I would make the trip with Don, not then understanding his heart for Israel and the Jewish people. Real, one reason I'm reading this is because I, I want every pastor in the world, I want us to, to be able to, to talk with every pastor in the whole world and bring them to the kind of thing that happened to David McQueen. And so he says, when I arrived at Don's home, ready to accompany him on his trip, he handed me a manuscript copy of your people should be my people. The book was soon to be published by Gospel Light Regal. Don suggested that I read it so that I would know what we were getting into when we got to the conference. Ironically, I was brash enough, which sounds kinder than arrogant, to believe that Dr. Finto wanted my critique and input on his book. So on the flight to Pennsylvania, I began reading, making editorial marks in the margin, though I myself had never written anything. When Don referenced Romans 11:12, 12, I was stunned and perplexed. How could this man have so utterly misquoted scripture? I had read Romans dozens of times, often in the original Greek, and I knew this letter well, so I thought, and this, I was confident that this verse was not a part of Paul's letter. 
So I stood up to get my Bible out of the overhead so that I could show Don his arrow. He asked what I was doing, and I told him that I thought he had misquoted quoted Paul. He smiled knowingly, assuring me that the manuscript had been well edited. I opened my Bible to Romans 11, verse 12, and I began to read, and it was as if I had never seen this passage before. I knew immediately that I was in a divine moment of revelation as the Father was inviting me to join with him in his purposes for the Jewish people and, and their connection to world revival as their opening to their Messiah. Don and I continued to our trip to the Messiah Conference where we spent several days with Jewish believers and their covenant Gentile partners. I returned to Abilene, shared my newfound revelation with our leadership, began to take groups of leaders to Israel and have become an avid advocate for this newly resurrected community of Jewish believers in Jesus. He's been responsible for taking piles of, of pastors over. So, the, so it is important if, we're, if this is true that the, that the Lord's not coming back to the Jewish people, it makes it all the more imperative. And I believe there are other passages that in, I believe the Zechariah passages seem to, seem to say that too in Zechariah 12 through 14. But we need to pay attention to promises like this. I live in the promise I'm about to read to you out of, out of Ezekiel 36, beginning with verse 20, 24. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries where you've, you've gone back into your own land. Anytime he says, I'm bringing you back from all the countries, it's today. Because this is the only time in history that Israel has been brought back from all the nations. Isaiah 43 verses five and six even says, I'll bring you back to the east and the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold them back. And that passage was a passage that some of the brothers read when they knew that the Jewish people were about to be released from, from Russia because it's north. And so Isaiah says, or, or Ezekiel says, I'm gonna bring you back from all the nations and I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will take out of you a heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and will move you to do my will. Now I take that along with Isaiah 62 verse seven, which says, you who call upon the Lord, give yourselves no rest, give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the whole world. And I take this as a personal imperative. I think the Lord is saying, bug me about this. You know, that importunate widow that kept begging and the judge wouldn't, God uses that as an illustration of himself. What do you think I'm gonna do when I want what you're saying? He's telling us, he wants us to bug us about this until we see all Israel saved. And I tell people, I, I just could possibly be a Simeon here that, I'll, that when I see Israel having come to faith, I can say, okay, you can take me now, I'm ready. But I don't even wanna go if I can stay here and do something to help it happen. And then um, in Hosea 3, 4, and 5, he says that Israelites won't have a king for many years, haven't had one since 586 B.C. when Zedekiah was taken to Babylon, won't have a sacrifice for many years, haven't had one since 70 A.D. Afterward, they will turn trembling to the Lord and do his blessing in the last days. And the fifth thing, that, the reason that I, that, we, that I believe we must stand with Israel is that when Jesus comes back, if we're not standing with Israel, if we think the Palestinians that don't even really exist have a place there, we're gonna be the wrong side when Jesus comes back. Because Zechariah 12 and 14 both talk about a time when all the nations surround Jerusalem. And in Zechariah 12, Jerusalem, it seems, is the victor. But in Zechariah 14, it looks like Israel just about to be wiped out and all of a sudden the Lord comes back to fight for Israel. And Zechariah 14 verse nine says that the Lord becomes king over the whole world. I believe that's when he starts the thousand year reign, that he comes back just at the time when it looks like Israel is about to be wiped out. So when this present crisis is happening in Israel, I'm confident of what 
Psalm 125 verse two says, the scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. That is a word of God. I believe Israel will ultimately prevail. It's not time for her to be wiped out, but at what a cost. And we need to keep praying that every single day. But I here's the, this is the next thing that I'm about to say. I, didn't, I never had even spoken it this way until about three or four months ago. But there's one chapter in the scripture. If it had been believed through the centuries, there would never have been any replacement theology. There would never have been any anti-Semitism. One chapter, if it had been believed, would have changed world history and even well, church history and even world history. It's Romans chapter 11. And I want you to get your Bibles when you go home and be sure that I'm saying what's really there and, you, and show it to everybody that's in doubt of this. I want to give you six things out of Romans 11 that if all this had been believed and would be believed today, there would be no anti-Semitism in the church or replacement theology. The first thing is in verses 1 and 11, Paul starts in, in what we know as Romans 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, he says. A descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. And then he goes on down and says a few words and he says in verse 11, well then I ask them, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. So God has not rejected his people. That is now, that's, that's, he has never rejected them and he never will reject them. But, uh, continuing in verse 11, the second thing that you see in Romans, in Romans 11 is that Gentile believers are supposed to be two things, as said in verse 11 and then verses 30 through 32. Gentile believers were to live in such a way to make Israel jealous for their own Messiah. In fact, I, I, you know, it's first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I've been wondering lately, I was, some of you know that I, Martha and I lived in Germany in post-war Germany for eight years. And, but I, I've been wondering that if I were a missionary today, I'm not so sure because of what Paul says in Romans 1 16, first to the Jew and also the Gentile, that if wherever I go, if I were in Mozambique, if I were in Johannesburg, South Africa, I'd try to find out if there's any Jews here, if there's a Jewish synagogue here. And I would go to them and I would let them know that I'm a believer in Jesus and I actually believe Jesus is your Messiah. You may not agree with me, but I'm here to tell you, I'm just here to honor you as the host family that brought us the Messiah. First to the Jew. I think there's a blessing that still rests on us if we do that. But, gen but anyway, verses 30 through 32 says this, just as you Gentiles who were at one time disobedient have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. We were to do two things that we have not done. The church has been the worst persecutors. We were to make her jealous for her Messiah and we were to show her mercy. The third thing that I see is, and this is the, one of the strongest ones, Gentiles were never to have replaced Israel. They're grafted in and share in the blessing, in the, in the root. Verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, the wild olive shoot, in other words, we didn't have the same kind of pruning and so forth that the Jewish people have had. And you, the wild olive shoot, have now been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root. Don't boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you don't support the root. The root supports you. Well, you say, well, some of the branches are broken off so that I can be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but, don't be, afraid, but be afraid. If God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you other. 
And if they do not consider therefore the kindness and sternness to God, sternness to those who failed, but kindness to you provided you to continue in his kindness. And if they don't persist in unbelief, they'll be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. So believers were never to have replaced Israel. We are grafted in to Israel. When the church is against Israel, they're against themselves because we're part of Israel. We're not Jews, but we're part of Israel. The fourth thing that I see is that when Israel comes to faith, it will release greater rich revival and life from the dead. In um, if their, verse, verse 12 that I already mentioned, if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? Amen. If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Unfortunately, the church didn't see this. There were a few people who did. For example, a man named Robert Layton in the year 1642 in a sermon on Isaiah 60 verse 1, which says, Arise and shine, said, Undoubtedly, that people of the Jews shall once more be commanded to arise and shine. And their return shall be the riches of the Gentiles and that shall be a more glorious time than ever the church of God did yet behold. Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century, one of very few, the church was so anti-Israel through all this. Jonathan Edwards says, though we do not know the time in which the Jewish people shall turn to Jesus, this much we must determine by scripture, that it will be before the glory of the Gentile part of the church shall be fully accomplished, because it is said that their coming shall be life from the dead to the Gentiles. And Charles Spurgeon said in a sermon in 1855, in a volume of sermons, I think we do not attach sufficient importance to the restoration of the Jews. The day shall yet come when the Jews who were the first apostles to the Gentiles, shall be gathered in again. He saw this. And until that shall be, the fullness of the church's glory can never come. Matchless benefits to the world are bound up with the restoration of Israel. Their gathering in shall be life from the dead. God's call on Israel is irrevocable, irrevocable. Again, I'm quoting from Romans 11, verses 28 and 20, 29. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs for God's call and his gifts are irrevocable. See, if the church had believed this, there would not have been the anti-Semitism. The Christian rulers of Spain couldn't have turned against them. Believers couldn't have been hood, hoodwinked by Hitler thinking whatever they thought in order that time. And then the last thing is in verses 25 and 26, ultimately, praise be to God, all Israel will be saved. And I tell you, we, listen, when God puts a promise in, I encourage you, pray scripture. Put your weight down on what God says. When I have a vision statement, and my vision statement starts off with seeing, saying, I believe the word of God more than I believe my own feeling or emotions. I believe the word of God more than I believe what anybody else says. When he says all Israel will be saved, I believe all Israel will be saved. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery so you won't be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved. Let me just say something about the fullness of the Gentiles. I was teaching a group of hippies years ago, packed into a little storefront from, and I was, I'd been teaching through Luke and we got to Luke 21 and I was screaming for help because I knew that Luke 21 was a parallel passage to Matthew 24 and Mark 13, March, Mark 13, when, when Jesus is, 
it's answering the question on when will the end come and all this kind of thing. And so I just said, let's pray that, let's, let's read this one more time and, just, and ask God for help. And inside I'm screaming for help. But on that day or night, whatever it was, I saw four scriptures that absolutely have been so embedded in me and I believe it answers the time of the, end of the Gentiles. In Luke 21, 20, the Lord says that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, you'll know its devastation is near. Everybody in the room knows what that is. That was 70 AD. Then he says in verse 24, and the Jewish people will be scattered to all the nations. Well, we all know that happened. And Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is over. Jerusalem was trampled on by Gentiles from the time of Babylonian captivity until 1967. That's the first time a sovereign state of Israel took possession of Jerusalem. Soon for all those cities. I believe the time of the Gentiles is over. Now let me tell you another way to look at it. The early believers were totally Jewish. There were no Gentiles. Converts maybe, but no, no Gentiles. That, then Cornelius came in and for a season we had Jews and Gentiles together. But then the church became so anti-Jewish that for 18, 19 centuries we had a Gentile church. There was not a Jewish expression. There was not a Jewish synagogue. But that's no longer the case. The time of Gentiles is over. The Jews are back. And the Jews are going to be back. And then he says in verse 28, when you, when you see these things beginning to take place, I have. Stand up and lift up your head because your redemption is near. I think he's telling us we're living in the end times of the end times. How long? I don't know. I will say, and I almost want to say don't quote me on this one, but I'm going to say it anyway. In verse 32, he says, this generation won't pass away till all these things happen. Well, it can't be the generation he was talking to. They're long since gone. Could it be? I'll put it in the form of a question. That way you can't quote me. Uh, could it be that the Lord had the longest Generation in history is 100 years. Israel was in Egypt 400 years and they, he was brought back, they were brought back in the fourth generation. Could it be that the Lord is saying that he's going to wrap this thing up by 2067? That would be 100 years. I'm just asking the question. I didn't say that it is. I'm just asking the question. You work on that one. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me, just, let me just close with this one scripture. Mark 11, verse 24, I love this. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be given to you. Lord, with one accord we come before you. We be I, I believe probably everybody in this room believes that we're living in in an unusual time when, and we're living with Jewish people who have come to faith since 1967, when you started something that's very unusual. But Lord, I've seen, we've seen the first fruits of this end time revival. But now it's time, Lord. You promised that when you would bring them back, you would put your spirit in them. You put your spirit in some of them, but Lord, there are several million in Israel that you haven't put your spirit in yet. And we're putting our weight down on your promise that you promised that. And we ask you to do it. And you said, Lord, through your word that when Jewish people come to faith, it'll be greater riches revival. It'll be like life from the dead. And I believe, Lord, that that means that that promise that you also made that this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to every, gen every ethnic group and then the end will come. We're seeing the possibility of that, Lord. Let, a, let us live. Let a, we just, I just ask that every one of us be so strong in this and so powerful in this that we spread this all over the world and become a part of this magnificent thing that you're doing in our generation. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. It began over 40 years ago. 
with a call from the Lord to change the way the world worships. Now, as Yeshua prophesied, we find ourselves in the midst of wars and rumors of wars. And as a result, God has enlisted us to raise up an army to change the way the world worships. In these days, the Lord has revealed to us a Hebrew word that has become our new mandate, avodah. It means devotion in worship, work, and service. Here at Wilbur Ministries, we put that commission into action. How do we do that? We carry the presence of God to the nations, preaching and singing the word of the Lord. From mountain villages in Latin America, to stadiums in the Middle East, and everywhere in between. But it's so much more than just the music. Shabbat shalom. Welcome to Shabbat in your home. It's about confronting the darkness in the media with our weekly broadcasts of Shabbat in your home and the Paul Wilbur and Friends and podcasts. Then we get into also the ministry elements. It's about bringing life to a forgotten African Jewish tribe by drilling freshwater wells. And it's about bringing much needed aid to the IDF and those on the front lines fighting for the survival of Israel. As you see on your TV screens and across social media, it is not only a spiritual war, but a physical one. It has never been more important to be doers of the word than it is today. When you partner with Wilbur Ministries, you are not only helping send the music out to the nations, but you are joining hands with the covenant people of God and those in need across the globe. The time to act is now. For Zion's sake, we will not keep silent. Partner with us. Help us to raise up an army to change the way the world worships. And to fulfill the words of Yeshua when he said, the Father was seeking those who would worship in spirit and in truth. Avodah. Become a part of our world partner family today. Go to wilburministries.com or scan the QR code on your screen.